Jeff, good afternoon. Hutton, good afternoon. Um, I followed the advice of one Todd Furman uh, last night on Sacramento State. As did and I. I am uh, very disappointed to say that the uh, uh, Spart- uh, no, the San Jose State Spartans, the uh, what's Sacramento, the Hornets, the Hornets of Sacramento State did not come through for us. But I thought Thursday night, uh, the, the opening Thursday night season did come through. The NC State, Western Carolina, unexpected close game I into know, the fourth yeah. quarter. Then you had Colorado and North Dakota State deliver. And that's the one everyone's talking about. How about that game? It delivered from opening possession and just never really let up. Fantastic game uh, for all the hype that was surrounding it. I thought going into it, Chad, it was going to be low scoring if North Dakota State was going to pull out the upset, you know, some turnover, sloppy play, whatever. And if Colorado was going to win the game, they were going to win big. And neither of those happened. Love the performance. It didn't look like either one was going to start the other in the first first quarter, back and forth. And then Colorado's defense really settled in, and North Dakota State kind of got away from what was working early in the game. There's no doubting Colorado's got a great quarterback and really four great wide receivers. When you go all the way down to Will Shepard, who was fourth statistically last night with uh, just two catches, but Jimmy Horn was two yards away from 200 we all know about Travis Hunter and how amazing he is, and he was last night on offense and defense. Uh, and then the, the transfer, Wester, the transfer from FAU, boy, they've got some weapons on the outside. The big question now for to just Colorado from a play standpoint, how far can superb quarterback and four great receivers get you in a season? Can and, it get this team that and, still has suspect line play, suspect running game, suspect defense, with their schedule now in the Big 12, can that get them to 6-6? Six and six? And, and we're going to find out. It's I mean, possible. They have two players, Chad, right now, top 10 in odds to win the Heisman Trophy. It, it, Hunter's now into the top 10, passing Shador Sanders. Shador's 10th. Hunter is 8th. Uh, the, the names in this list are interesting. Nico, uh, he is 8th as well. Same odds. It's fascinating to see where Vegas sees things before we see everyone else play. Travis Hunter in the top 10 for Heisman odds. And, I mean, it's it's a four-pack of receivers, but it's a one of one when it comes to the sheer talent and entertainment that Travis Hunter gives us on both sides of the ball. That touchdown catch, man, where he goes through the defender on the, you know, on the boundary, phenomenal. I mean, it's, it, it's really hard to not pull for this guy. I, I love watching him play. Yeah, I, I he, love he played him. all but two snaps. I love watching him too, and he he was awesome. Shadour Sanders is incredible too. Yeah, underrated toughness. I mean, that guy gets crushed. Yes, he does. And he continues to get back up, and he has really done a good job of avoiding injury, considering how hard he gets hit and how often he gets hit in the games. But as much as I want to fall in love with their play, then Shadour Sanders decides to take a deep shot. When all they had to do was work the clock and get out of there, yeah. and that opened up a chance for North Dakota State to get the ball back and possibly lose the game? Can't right. have that. Can't yeah. have it. No, the, the heady play was, was not there on that. You know, the one pick, I thought that was going to change the game. I thought that's when North Dakota State was going to take over. But, you know, the, the ball bounces towards them. The Bison get it back. It was the like turnover. the old uh, Nebraska they, what, two versus, yards away? if you remember Nebraska versus Missouri, Matt Davison, the kick up into the air, and Nebraska scores a touchdown to win that game. Yeah. That's what it felt like off the calf muscle into the air for the interception. Yes. Uh, that was a, a crazy play. They North, now, North Dakota State was, to me, every bit as good as advertised coming into it. How about Cam Miller? But Colorado impressed. survived. Impressed by him, too. I was impressed with his first half. He had a nice run to make it interesting well, late. I mean, I, I'm watching this going, yeah, you're right. Things dropped off. And they're still in the game on the final play to win it. I, I, I just... I, I get that North Dakota State is superb for their level, but we end everything with North Dakota State with for their level. Yeah. Any competent group power conference school defensive line is going to destroy that yes. Colorado offensive line. That, that was my takeaway from that game last night. And I'll Vegas say the same knew. about watching Vegas NC knew. State last night. Western oh, Carolina been... was in their backfield all over Grace McCall, and I'm thinking – Tennessee's offensive line next week should destroy that offensive line. Should. Head to head. I mean, they should live in the backfield against them. So there's it, 
we could say everything after last night and after this weekend and put out there, preface it by saying it's one game, but you see quite a bit. There's only 12 over the course of the season. You only get 12 of these, and one game in, I... I've got big thoughts on this. I feel stronger about Shador Sanders and the receivers being even better than maybe expected, and I have the exact same concerns about every other part of Colorado. No. Last night. Yep. Uh, Concerns as well. You mentioned uh, what lives across both these teams. Uh, What lives with Deion Sanders is criticism. He can't get over it. I mean, he's called out practically any media member recently that's had anything negative to say whatsoever, uh, including a media member who's just guilty by association. The CBS CBS Sports post negative comment, and all of a sudden, uh, yeah, I'm CBS not not dealing with that. No, not commenting. Uh, So the most recent one was with um, Keeler. Is it Sean? Sean Keeler, Sean Keeler. A columnist for the Denver Post, who is now no longer allowed to ask questions to Deion Sanders. That came through the university. And it, it, big storyline. Third quarter rolls around. North Dakota State's leading the game. They're about to begin the second half, and Mark Jones, who's on play-by-play, has this to say to add in to their production and uh, meetings and prep work leading up to kickoff and what was a major discussion point and storyline about the Colorado program and their head coach. 25-yard line, there has been a swirl of noise and activity around this Colorado program in the last couple of weeks. Let's listen to it in Coach Prime's words. Eric Christensen with CBS Sports Colorado. Um, CBS, Tyler, I'm, I'm, I'm not doing nothing with CBS. Next question. Joe Rigo, my I ain't got nothing to do with you. It's above that. I ain't got nothing to do with you. I got love for you. I appreciate and respect you. I ain't got nothing to do with you. They know what they did. Coach John Keeler, the Denver Post. You, you don't like us. Why do you do this to yourself? Come on. Like, it would be hard for me to really engage in someone I don't like or something I don't like. I'm just asking why. Like, why? Jimmy Horn picking up the first down on that opening play, first down and 10. And uh, Coach Prime, in meeting with him yesterday, he felt that, you know, at 4 and 8, 3 and 9 news conference, this is one of the parts from the Denver story. But that Coach Prime told us he felt that the reporter in question questioned and attacked his faith and subsequently went over the line and thus his actions as a result. That's what he told us. I mean, uh, questioned his faith. He, he used phrases Keeler did. Like false prophet. False prophet. Uh, others that they mentioned specifically, the university did. Planet Prime, Bruce Lee of BS, the Dion Kool-Aid Circus, uh, Deposition Dion. Those were specific to why they're no longer letting him ask questions. But false prophet, one of them. And, you know, that's, I'm assuming, leading into his all the hype versus result. And the record last year, the hype of the first three games and then the result of how things turned out down the stretch. But Dion is going to find anything that he wants to find. If, he's, if you're not with him, he's against you. There's no doubt about that. And you're not going to be able to do what you're there to do, which is try to be balanced as possible in an era where you're just not allowed to do it. And in this manner, and in the way they're handling this at Colorado, the university is totally fine with it. They put it in his contract. But attacking the faith. How, if you want to end a discussion in 2024 or end criticism about yourself, uh, there's one or two ways to quickly kind of get rid of it, and that is to claim racism or say someone's attacking your religion. There's another Or one. making fun of your religion. Mental health. Mental health, that's another great one. Hey, it's a mental health issue. Don't criticize me anymore. The, the, those are three. Desmond Howard threw that out We there just gave it. you the trifecta, yeah. right? If yeah. you claim mental health problems, you're free from criticism. If you claim someone's a racist or being racist towards you or claim racism at any time, this is the playbook I'm giving you right now. I'm not writing yep. a book like Clay did with American Playbook, <laughs> but I'm giving you the audible version of it right now. Three ways to free yourself from all criticism. Cry racism, cry mental health, and three is cry religion 
and say they're mocking my religion. I, I got I got nothing to say now uh, on Deion Sanders. Well done, Prime. <laughs> I, just, I mean, I got nowhere to go there because why not say if it in he's the moment? calling him a false prophet, literally saying that he is a false prophet and that he is a believer in Jesus Christ and talks about Jesus Christ, but he really isn't. That's what a false prophet is, someone who comes under the cloak of one thing and is actually the devil. Then if he's if anybody thinks he's literally saying that, which I did not take it from that, yeah. it's a phrase about what he's doing with Colorado football. But if you took it literally and you want to say he attacked my faith, I mean, I got nothing else to say about it. Then well, he attacked your faith, and you have every right to say he's not allowed to ask you a question. It's a, it's so a, well done. That, that's the playbook. That's one of the three ways to free yourself from all criticism. And then uh, two questions later, he gets a, a, a softball about his birthday celebrations or plans. It also depends on who is being covered here. It, this is prime time. But Harrison Butker had his faith attacked. Yeah. And... You know, it was wide open. Didn't matter. It, it, in regards to that, Bucker had to defend himself. That, the media will keep receipts on this for Dion too. They will. And, uh, yes, um, Harrison Butker and his faith talking about it and then I mean, I, I, you saying something controversial. If Deion Sanders... I'm saying Deion's, Deion's the one that threw this it, out there. I, and I don't know where, where Deion Sanders said it, but if he came out and said, you know, I support the Supreme Court's decision to overturn Roe versus Wade because I'm a Christian well, and I'm pro-life, and then said, and now I'm going to block this guy because he attacked my faith, he would be getting far more criticism about the first statement that he said and, and not the other. Now, now this just kind of shuts it up. Yeah, it's just I a, think this is a convenient way, and I'm not saying he's lying about why he he clearly took it literally. But he Sean didn't Keeler. say that to Sean Keeler in the moment, in front of him. No, he, they just banned him. Man, you just don't like us. Yeah, they just banned him. And it was Colorado that stepped up and I, it did it. You know, it's just... it's it's, it's It shuts down the conversation, right? We have conversations on this show. We'll continue to have them, but... I hear false prophet, and I think it's a phrase, it's a, it's a turn of phrase to talk about Deion Sanders is falsely saying this, this, and this about what Colorado football is going to be and what they are, and it's not the truth about it. I mean, if Deion Sanders takes it as, I'm an actual false prophet is his accusation, and he is a strong, faithful believer in Jesus, what Which, are we to say about that? Well, that? Okay, I guess he's got the right to ban him from asking him questions. But, but see, I just don't think the guy was being literal with that. But it, no. But what I think and what Dion thinks really is kind of irrelevant if he took it as being literal. Well, if it, it, I'm kind of defending no, Dion no, a little bit here in a weird way. No, if he took it as negative, then it's not good. Yeah. It, like it, it, it just it, it, no one can stand for it. You got to be with us or you're against us. There's no reporting here. There's no opinion. You can't, I mean, he can continue to write all he wants, but he just can't ask questions in person to then face the person that he's talking trash about. But see, here's, here's why it's not going to go away. Because there will always be another column or post or reel from someone else that's going to criticize Deion Sanders. And then he's going to respond with it. But it's going to you know, not be face-to-face. It's probably going to come through Colorado first. And then Mark Jones, through a production meeting, I mean, I'm glad he said it, but he, I mean, you can tell, even he's just like, that's what he told us. You know, it, so, and he, they threw this out in the third quarter. Yeah. You know, so, but here's also part of the issue. Oh, by the way, I'm glad he threw it out. At oh, some yeah, point, yeah, yeah. he found a, an a, opening to do it. They had to discuss it. Yeah, so, but here's, but it was brief, very brief. But here's also why it's not going to go away. Because you have those like, Desmond Howard, who said this in regards to Dion's response to Sean Keeler and not having questions anymore from him. When I first heard the story, the first thing that popped in my head was how we talk about protecting your mental health. I don't know if people realize that Dion Sanders is a human being who has spoke openly about trying to commit suicide before. So when you have a person who is an advocate for mental health, who not only wants to protect his mental health, but the number one job of a coach is to protect the mental health of his players too, because you always want to treat all of your players like they're your sons. Uh, that's Desmond Howard citing Keeler's 
um, overall efforts approach in how he wrote what he wrote. Uh, I mean, this guy... Well, now we just need someone to call Keeler a racist, and we fit well, all no. three. How about Dion then literally days later, or days before, calling up Paul Feinbaum? Dying breed. What if Paul Feinbaum said, I've, I've dealt with mental illness or mental but, health issues also. But I'm, I'm, I'm saying like... Really affected me. It's not... Uh, it, it won't go away because Dion's always going to then... He's going to stoke... Yeah, he's going what, to poke the fire. What was it Stephen A. Smith said? He, he's throwing out fighting words and then he's backing down or going into hiding when people respond. Right. And so you, you can't keep, have it both ways. And I, again, like last... I didn't see this last year. I, yeah, and, and now it's, it's it, starting the season on the defensive and... Last year, it was way different. It was more hype, and people bought into it. Some people didn't. There was a lot of those that said, no way. He's not doing it. And then they go on the road, and they win, and the hype train just takes off. Great. I mean, they put all the figures up there last night about what it's meant. It's great. Uh, I'm entertained by it, yes. I, I love the players involved with it, yes. But, like, um, I mean, to just go down the path. Dion didn't say this publicly. He said no. this in a production meeting and that was then put on air very quickly, just nonchalant, just and that's what he told us. And, gonna, and more back to this great game. I'm gonna I'm gonna violate one of the you know talking about one of the three things we just mentioned that are untouchables in 2024 in our current okay. soft society and culture. But if mental health is a concern, as as Desmond Howard says, I, I think that it would be better and more beneficial to the players. If Deion Sanders handled that in a different way and said, hey, here's how we can control our own mentality and our own mental health is not letting outside critics that aren't here every day or aren't around it affect how we think about ourselves or how we conduct our business. So I'm just not going to worry about this guy who's saying all that. We're going to go about our business, and that's going to help you be a, a more mentally uh, healthy person moving forward. That would be a great way to handle it. Now, I can't tell Deion Sanders how to handle his own mental health or whatever Desmond Howard's no. talking about. It's just, it's very convenient to me that he hit, now we've had two of the three untouchables yep. that everybody's criticizing Deion Sanders, and well, let me flip it on its head by saying he's attacking my faith, and then Desmond Howard coming out and saying it's about mental health, and he struggled with it in the past. Then all of a sudden, people just stop criticizing him or talking about him being soft, which it was a soft move. Whether yes. you want to blame him attacking his religion or mental health, it's a soft move to not allow someone to ask you a question because you don't like their columns in the Denver Post. And it's not going that's to affect about the you. results here. It's, it, a, it's a soft it, unless move. Unless it continues to be a distraction. Now, I we mean, could talk about why is it a soft move, and that's what we're getting into now, but regardless, it, it's, it's soft. Mean, yeah, and, and you also have, you know, Feinbaum's talking about the program in being irrelevant in terms of the top shelf of college football. That's absolutely true in terms of result and what's going to factor in to the college football playoff. I'm watching SportsCenter this morning, and they have Paul Feinbaum on. They don't mention a thing about what Deion Sanders just said about Paul Feinbaum, and Paul Feinbaum doesn't reference it at all. But he's asked about Colorado, and yeah. he goes into this, hey, I thought Shador Sanders and Travis Hunter and, and Jimmy Horn looked great. Receivers, quarterback looks good. Everything else doesn't look that good. And they beat an FCS opponent by five points. Congrats. Now I guess we all get to get back to talking about how they're going to compete with Ohio State and Georgia we go. for a national title. And he kind of said that smirking and laughing about what's the next question going to be. And then the guy, the sports center anchor, and I don't know his name, apologies for that, said, well, hey, uh, North Dakota State's legit, Paul. <laughs> they're legit. They've won nine FCS national titles. And five bombs like, yeah, okay, yeah, they're, they're legit. Okay, yeah, very legit. Which they are a good football program yes. and a good team at their level and maybe the best at their level program-wise, but, I mean, come on. To think that they're not going to go win the Big 12 or compete nationally because of a five-point home win over them is also ludicrous. So I get what Paul Feinbaum's saying. Hutton, you said if you're not standing with me, then you're against me, sort of like the prayer that we've read before. I will tell you who stands with Colorado and Deion Sanders, and that is Mark Jones of ESPN. Oh. And Roddy Jones, oh, his broadcast partner. Go. Yes. Good Lord. Yeah, I, know. I thought I was listening to the hometown radio broadcast of the game. The excitement level, the octaves that go up in the voice 
whenever Colorado does something. <laughs> and the disappointment when North Dakota State dared to have a good play Intercepted. was palpable. How many times have they mentioned cow. that they sold out the stadium for the season? And I'm I, thinking, like, again, like, that is exactly Paul Feinbaum's point that you have to reference this five times throughout the broadcast. Did you notice this? Yeah. Every time they came back, you know, this stadium is uh, sold out. Fans are behind. Like, we knew I mean, that. It was, this happened last year. It feels like Mark Jones when he calls Deion Sanders games. Like, I mean, like Pedro Gomez covering Barry Bonds back in the day. Mark Jones is the play-by-play voice of Deion Sanders, Coach Prime, in Colorado. It was a hometown broadcast. Oh, no doubt. Yes. I, if you're, it was I, not. I usually don't try to get into all this. Oh, they prefer your team over this one on the national broadcast. There's no doubt Didn't, about uh, it. Anyone who tuned into that game, if you're a Colorado fan or whoever, you try to tell me that was an unbiased, impartial, nationally televised game. This, it was not. They were all for Colorado. The sideline reporter, correct me if I'm wrong, it may have been the rules. I can't. Mentioned that Shador faked a cramp. It was early in the game, first yeah, half. Yeah. He threw that out there. And, the, and Mark, it was one of them, said, I, I see what you did there. And then straight back to it. Like, again, like for clock purposes, playing into all of that, but not really critical. It, it's, you're, you're right. That was another moment where I but thought. But it's not surprising. I just thought, is this, a, is this a well-coached team or not? Because it was just a clear punt situation, and they had no idea if defense, offense, yeah. or special teams on the field. Yeah. So Shador had to basically fall to the ground like he was shot to try to get them a but, timeout. Yeah, uh, it was that. That was an odd moment. But if you if you hate Coach Prime in Colorado, you are not going to want to hear Mark Jones on the call because that dude loves him some Buffaloes. He loves him some Coach Prime, and it is clear. I think everyone that goes into a game that calls it nationally, they have a rooting interest whether they know it or not. And usually the rooting interest is they want a better game than expected or they want a good game. So they're kind of naturally rooting yeah. for the team that's behind to make it close. And sometimes that comes out. They don't want that here. All the time it came out in they, this one. They the don't. whole game, it was clear Mark Jones wanted Colorado to win. Oh, I mean, ESPN and the, the company wants Colorado to win. They don't want FCS winning week one after what happened last year with the the national audience that jumped on board. No different than like Caitlin Clark missing the playoffs. Yeah. You know, same thing. Chad, I, I have five storylines that I am rooting for. Great segue that you set up here. Mm-hmm. I'm rooting for these five You're headlines. You're the Mark Jones of these five storylines. Yes. Um, if these five storylines were Coach Prime and Colorado football, Hutton is well, now Mark Jones. Here's, here's the, the difference, though. These five storylines I'm rooting for will also allow and produce results that I'm totally against. So there is some conflict, but here are the five. Number one, and they, in no particular order, by the way, uh, the results over the first two weeks of the college football season, I'm rooting for the idea that Results and performance will be remembered December 8th whenever we find out on Selection Day the 12 teams in the college football playoff. That's number one. Now You want them to be remembered. Yes. Yeah. It, and I, I think, you, you know, we, we... I agree with you. We hit on NC State last night. So NC State is a prime example. They won't be the only example. Yeah. But they struggled, struggled to put, what, Western Carolina? To put them away. It was a tie game in the fourth quarter. Uh, it, it was 21-17 going into the fourth quarter. The 21-17, yeah, you're right, 21-17 yeah. Western Carolina. Western Carolina leads this game going into the, the fourth quarter. Uh, now, the final score is 38-21. NC State wins. It needs to be remembered for more than that score when December rolls around and it's week one and you just see it and you move on. Because NC State has two tough matchups, real, real tough matchups left. Tennessee and Clemson on the road at Clemson. Um, beyond that, I mean, they, they face Georgia Tech on the road. They will face UNC at home, who've lost their quarterback. And, I mean, it is a cupcake schedule as far as conference play is concerned. So I'm not for rewarding the team that could, I mean, they, they're legitimately, if they win one of the two tough games, Tennessee and Clemson, Chad, we could see them. 
trying to get to the college football playoff. They Either they're the ACC conference. champ or an at-large. No, no doubt. If, and as an at-large, I don't want the situation to, to come up where you have the a, a two-loss team or a three-loss team that is clearly better, more battle-tested because of those losses when you have NC State, who's not in this scenario, the ACC champ, getting the at-large bid because of the better record and being rewarded for that. Again, uh, on the flip side, I'm the same. This, I realize I'm all for Florida State and the argument they made last year. But there were better teams at that moment going into the college football playoff that jumped them. Yeah, uh, and, and here's another part of that, too. The NC State example is a good one, Hutton. Also, you know, Oregon getting blasted by Georgia in week yeah, one, yeah. Th- that's got to matter, too. Like, yes. Teams are allowed to get better? Absolutely. Should and, we factor in how they looked in the month of November versus the month of September? Of but Sure, but I, that I hope, still has to count. It's one of 12. I hope that the committee members did more than just – watch the game, and then move on. I, I hope they documented the performance. It should factor into what we saw. Uh, Chad, I'm, I'm rooting for Travis Hunter. Dion is is going to annoy and distract where th- the coverage should be laser-focused. He's going to mandate this, whatever. Shador is, is going to be praised because he's primetime son, and you know he requires that Everyone be positive, Dion, about Shador and his play. No tough questions, no criticism. And Colorado's record is likely to lead to Hunter being like September's Heisman, but then December's finalist is how I'd view it. This dude is legit. And if he were playing for Ohio State or Georgia or Oregon, uh, the list can go on here. He's the Heisman favorite going into the season. You got a lot of transfers going on, and you have a, a dual threat, two position player who plays all but two snaps last night at wide receiver and corner. He's the Heisman favorite going in. And I think he's going to be knocked down a notch later in the year when the record gets worse, and potentially you have Shador who's banged up. Again, not against Travis Hunter. I just hope it's not held against him that he's playing in Boulder and not playing in Athens or in Columbus. You know when you really see that guy's athleticism, Travis Hunter, the dance moves after a <laughs> touchdown? I, I, that's like when Michael Jackson did the moonwalk for yeah. the first time and everyone thought he was an alien sent to earth because of how he could move. That's the way I feel when I watch Travis Hunter celebrate a touchdown and some of the quickness of his dance, his hips – how he can release his hips and dance, Quick hips. Uh, remarkable. I twitchy. Tr- oh, twitchy. I mean, I all the superlatives, all the edges like describe someone who can really dance. That's Travis Hunter. Um, and and let me also the point opposite out, of the Australian breakdancer. I respect the hell out of him because of the lacerated liver last mm-hmm. year. Came back in like three, four weeks. I mean, I, again, like, and you don't really hear from him. He's kind of quiet. Yeah. Um, I'm rooting for Chip Kelly to have success and find success again. But with his success, Chad, Ryan Day wins big. He stays at Ohio State. And he likely beats Michigan in this scenario. And he's praised for getting over the hump and being potentially the national championship winning coach. In a year where he gave up play calling duties to Chip Kelly, who comes in and has that type of success, it's going to bolster Chip Kelly. It's also going to bolster Ryan Day. I don't hate Ryan Day. It's just going to ruin my prediction I had last year that he's the next head coach after Eberflus of the Chicago Bears because he'll end up staying at Ohio State. Um, Billy Napier and Sam Pittman. Let's go. I have no allegiance to Florida or Arkansas. But in, in Napier's case, I mean, he's already been beheaded before the season started. The question is, is Florida really going to fire him before the season ends? Can he get to seven and five? Seven and five is the bar. And if the bar is that low at Florida in a prove it year early in his tenure, he doesn't have a chance. I hope that we see the best of Billy Napier and what he's capable of as a coach because we've seen it before at other levels. And Sam Pittman, chat. 
I'm rooting the man for is this God's man. gift he to the state great. of Arkansas. He's the perfect Arkansas coach. But the problem is, it ends up it ends up sports washing yet again Bobby Petrino. Because if they win, it's going to be because of Bobby Petrino and that offense. All will be forgiven. And you've got Bobby Petrino who's done nothing but lie <laughs> and uh, demand that his way is, is the correct way, uh, cheat specifically with the staffer that he hired, paid $30,000 to and denied, but then Arkansas confirmed. Um, you've got you know, this, uh, the, the playbook from the, West, the, the Wake Forest broadcaster that Louisville had to confirm after Bobby Petrino denied, leaving after a Monday night football game in week 13, week 11 of the season with the Atlanta Falcons. He said, I don't know where people are, are getting this. I have no intention of leaving. Two weeks later, dude bolts and resigns, quits. And you have players, Chad. Let me, uh, I went and looked at some of the quotes back then. For the Falcons? Defensive coordinator Mike Zimmer. By the way, Monday night, players are off Tuesday. They came back, they had like a 70 word note on their lockers from Bobby Petrino. He wouldn't even talk or say something to their face. Uh, Defensive coordinator Mike Zimmer called him a gutless bastard. Joey Harrington said that he wasn't a man, doesn't know what it, what it means to stand up and be a man. Uh, and you had Lawyer Malloy, he just wrote the word coward in red Sharpie on the, the letter that he, Petrino left and then just taped it to his locker behind him again. Again, I hope Sam Pittman keeps his job, but... This, Didn't he also remember this Bobby guy's Petrino? Be propped up like he's back. Our uh, our our guest uh, Senator Tommy Tuberville now. Remember when he like oh. backs was backstabbing his old friend and boss yes. Tommy Tuberville? He took because it. he was on uh, Bobby Lerner, whoever the the team booster is, the big like the team president, yes, the team owner of Auburn, Bobby Louder. Bobby Louder uh, is the rich guy for Auburn, and he was on his private jet from Louisville to go interview or talk about the Auburn job and then denied it? No, so he just, so last, without telling anyone, just like he did with the Jacksonville Jaguars, by the way, he, Tom Coughlin doesn't speak to him to this day because Coughlin found out when he was the OC of the Jags that following off season, he took the OC job with uh, Auburn. And the Jags and Coughlin found out through the press release and announcement that Auburn had. Uh, he then does that to Auburn behind the scenes to his former boss in Tuberville, where he takes the Louisville job and then after accepting it, then goes back to interview with the booster at Auburn, if I remember this. Yes. And, and then there are everything's denied, and then there are records of a private plane bringing the president and the AD to meet with Petrino. Yep. While Tuberville is the head coach. And he, Tuberville goes on to remain the head coach since like 2008 or something. Yeah. He had a nice, nice run at Auburn. Yeah. It's a, a hell of a storyline. Final thing, uh, Dabo's approach. I'm rooting for Dabo's approach to how he handles things at Clemson. I, I like it because I respect him for all the success he's had. Uh, I, I like his work ethic and mindset. It's old school. We, we crave that nowadays. I also find him irritating and very awkward, cringeworthy, and, you know, he'll, he'll rap or dance or film videos with recruits. A lot of coaches do this, but you can tell with him, it's like the, at any point, you know, it's the, the dad, whenever you're a teenager, being very <laughs> cringeworthy and hokey. And, I don't know, I just, just kind of irritates me. I find him very annoying, but yet I want him to have success and continue to be able to throw the middle finger up even though he won't do that or take calls from what Spartanburg if they beat Georgia if they I, I know if they if I, they beat Georgia I, I said it yesterday I'll say it again that he will burn the city of Atlanta down like Sherman on his march to the I, sea I, I asked the that question he will earlier burn this week. every single media member who ever questioned him at the, that point I asked Bobby Carpenter this the, the season's over in his eyes at that point on oh. I have defeated I have defeated I, your God <laughs> I have defeated your champion, and now I am right. Everyone else is wrong. You can all politely, yeah, do all the things. GTFO. Do all the things to yourself. He'll take calls on his show the following week.